wonderful day. So, young, young people, little ones, pastor calls you monkeys, you actually going to stay in with us today. Is that exciting? <laughs> and they're like, we got to listen to you? Well, don't worry. In a couple more years, some of y'all will be <laughs> up in youth. So, so some exciting, exciting things going on. Um, Alright, so this morning, um, my title is going to be Losers. Has anybody ever seen this? They're doing the right one. Losers, right? Um, the reason for this is, uh, to kind of give you a little background of what I like, I love watching documentaries, um, stories about people's lives, where they've come from, uh, how they've got to where they're at. I think it's interesting, just people's lives, history. Um, sometimes people think it's boring, but you know, there's a lot that you can learn in history. And there's a lot of things that you can learn from other people's lives. I know I, I'm a big believer in not trying to recreate the wheel. So if it's already rolling, jump on, right? <laughs> like, I don't want to have to try to figure out myself. Um, I think sometimes if Somebody tells you something's bad and it can hurt you. I'm a big proponent of stay away from it. Don't test it to see for yourself. Now, some of us are stubborn. I'm not going to look at anybody when I say that. And sometimes we have to touch the hot stove. But uh, so on Netflix, there's a series called Losers or Loser, and uh, it kind of brought my to my attention. You know, it's just that's just the title. It's a big subtitle there, and uh, the the first part, or the first episode, that started making me think here, uh, talk about the first episode, the subtitle that described the story, it said, forced into boxing by his abusive father, Michael Bent became a world champ, but a knockout loss, dot, 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 changes his life and helps him find his true passion. Now what's interesting, there's about six Six videos of, uh, of athletes, pretty much all athletes, that in their life, um, through their competitions and, and what they're doing, uh, in all accounts, uh, society would call them losers. Um, in situations with Michael, um, he states that he never really liked boxing, that it wasn't something that he enjoyed, but his father made him do it. But in that, in his amateur, in his amateur part of boxing, he was very good. He won all kinds of titles, all different types of stuff as an amateur, had all kinds of belts, if you know much about boxing. Um, and then when he went pro, his first fight, he got beat really bad. <laughs> and uh, basically, everybody turned against him. The, the promoters, the boxing world, they were like, he's no good. Now listen, dude just won tons of amateur fights. Like that's not easy. Like winning belts as an amateur, but when it came to the money and he lost the fight, he became a loser because he didn't make people money. That's how our world looks at us sometimes. There was an, another interesting one that stood out for me. I'm not a golfer, so those golfers that are in the room may enjoy this. Uh, there was a French golfer, I think it was like in 1986 or 89, um, ever since he was a little boy, uh, his, he loved golf. They uh, said that his father was an industrialist, um, that they enjoyed vacationing, different things. They had a home that backed up to a golf course. And at that time, um, in the early 70s, uh, golf was more for what they called elitists, is what they used in the, uh, the term there um, in the French country. And so, but he would look out and he would see those people playing golf and at a young age, he had told his parents, he said, I want to do that. And so what they did was they took him to a putt-putt course. <laughs> and they went out there and he said, that lasted a couple weeks before my dad took me to a real golf course. And so at the time, French golf was not real popular. Um, there wasn't a lot of French people that were playing golf. And uh, so his father couldn't understand why his son 
wanted to make a career out of playing golf. Uh, but he did really well. Uh, Jean, as they say, uh, did really well, won some tournaments, um, some different things. But when he got to the British Open, which is one of the premier um, golf tournaments that are out there, uh, they weren't for sure how well he was going to do. And uh, so he gets out there and on the first day, he is on the leaderboard for golf. And nobody in the golfing world has ever heard about him. This golfer like came out of nowhere. So they said on the first night of the press conference, there were like two French press that were there just because he was French interviewing. On the second day of the tournament, he was on the leaderboard again and the room started getting bigger. More people started coming to the press conferences. Um, and then on the last day, he came in with a, I think, uh, you gotta forgive me the terms, I don't, I'm not much, I'm a hiker, not a golfer when I play. Uh, so um, he was ahead by six on the last hole of the tournament. And so literally, he could have double bogeyed the hole, which means two over uh, what the par was, could have double bogeyed the hole and still won the tournament. Now what's interesting is, in the British Open, it is very difficult, it's a very difficult course. They say there's high winds, the terrain, the way the course is laid out. And so what they were shocked about was because he could win this just by simple shots. So he could, they said he could literally take, took his uh, wedge and just wedged it all the way onto the green and, and could win. Well, what he was known for is he would get out there and he'd pull his driver out and he'd just swing that driver. <sighs> well, what ended up happening was it went over into the fairway on the 17th pole. So not a bad lie, but it's out of, it's, it's, it's still in play, but it's out of a decent play. So then he comes up and he grabs an iron. So he's got one shot on. His second shot could be on the green. So he comes out, I think it's a two iron he grabbed and he hits it and they say when he hits it, they hear the ball ping off of something. And what happened was the ball hit the stands and bounced back and the way this hole was, before you get over it, there was heavy grass and that ball pinged back into the heavy grass. So now he's in tall grass trying to hit the shot and before the hole there's a, there's a, a like a moat of water that's here with a high wall. And so he gets up there and he hits that ball and he swings through it, hits the ball, and it goes into the water. <laughs> so they have a picture, I should have put it up there. They have a picture where he's rolling up his pants, he climbs down in the water, he can see, he can see the ball where it was, it was barely out of water, but when he stepped in there, the ball sank. So he couldn't hit the ball. So then he had to take what's called a drop. So he could take the ball, come back over to the high grass and drop the ball. And so he dropped the ball, then he hit it again and it landed in the sand. <laughs> Nothing was going right for this guy. Now listen, this is the tournament of all tournaments to win. He could have took, took his time, took easy shots, all this kind of stuff, nothing was working out. He gets it in the sand, he chips it up. Before you know it, there's a three-way tie between all of the people there. So they have to play another hole. Well, at the end of it, he comes in second place. <laughs> what was it? Uh, the first, first, uh, second place is just first place loser? Is that what they say? Right? Here he had all this recognition, all this excitement about this French golfer because the last time a French golfer won the French Open was in like 1908. So it was a big deal for him to win this. And then when the press conference was after, guess how many people were at his press conference? Zero. Not very many, right? So he was a loser. Um, so it was interesting, you know, looking at these stories and seeing these things about what these people had accomplished, but then also failed at. And so, not rejoicing in their failure, but it's, it's amazing how you get to a certain point in your life, but then have failure 
and everybody forgets about the wonderful things that you do. And they call you a loser for it. So I know what my definition of loser was or is. And so, of course, I always like to go to the dictionary when I, when I talk about these words because I want to make sure that I at least have a good grasp of what that means. And so a lot of times when you hear the, the word loser, you feel like in a situation of a sport or a competition, somebody that doesn't win, a loser. So it says, uh, definition of it, uh, one of the first definitions says, a person or a thing that loses or has lost something, especially a game or a contest, which that's kind of how I you know, define the loser. Uh, a person who accepts defeat with good or bad graces, again, losing. And then this was another interesting, where I kind of had an idea, but a person or thing that is put at a disadvantage by a particular situation or course of action, a loser. So sometimes you would hear the connotation, somebody born on the other side of the tracks or they live on the other side of the tracks or you know, somebody in the situation here, or you know, we automatically kind of define them in certain ways. Now what's interesting was when we were singing these songs this morning, I'm like thinking, man, I'm talking about losers today. And God just said in all his songs this morning, how we're not. He ruined my message. He gave all the answers first. But that's our God. Right? The answers are all in front of us. So when I think about, um, we're going to talk about some examples, but in the Bible, in Genesis 5.20, it says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So there's situations sometimes that happen that society or somebody may deem us as a loser, that God may just be having the, these things that we come into our lives prepare us for something amazing to come out of it. So my first example, of course, is Joseph, right? He had that nice fancy jacket. He was his dad's favorite. Had some dreams about some, you know, everybody bowing at him, right? Just a kid. His brother's like, he's a loser. I can't believe he's saying this stuff, right? This is crazy. You know, he runs into, you know, his brothers are jealous of him. They throw him into a pit. They sold him into slavery. They lied about him. He was lied about. He was put in jail, right? Sounds like a loser to me, for my definition. We have David, right? He was just a, just a shepherd boy, right? Everybody was out on the battlefield. He's in the field, right? Just the shepherd boy, you know, later in life committed adultery, murder, lying. Sounds like a loser to me. Samson, you know, it was interesting. Uh, I was at a conference a couple weeks ago and they were talking about Samson. And when you think about Samson, how do they usually like depict him in pictures? Like this big muscle man, right? Like Samson, I'm Samson, I'm strong. Well, what was interesting was um, when they talk about Samson and his enemies, their en his enemies were confused about the fact how Samson got his strength. And if you see some dude that's like jacked, that has some big muscles, you know he's strong, right? There's no question about that he's strong. Samson was probably like my son Zachary. You know, not that he's not strong, but just normal, right? Not real jacked, you know, just kind of normal. And it confused the enemies of how Samson gained his strength. They didn't understand that. But that was a gift that he was given from God. And Samson gave that gift away. He, gave, he knew what he was supposed to do and he just gave it away. A loser. Interesting one are the disciples, a group of misfits. Guys that probably really shouldn't have ever really been together, right? It's not like they're a group of guys that some of them would have been, because some are fishermen, but we have some other, you know, probably guys that probably not really mesh well together, a group of misfits. And then, of course, in that group is Peter, 
right? Yeah. <laughs> he had anger issues. <laughs> he had some personal issues. Yeah. And of course, his best buddy Jesus, who he's been hanging out with, right? It's crucified, and then, you know, Jesus tells, you know, Jesus, before the happens, told him, you know, before the, you know, the rooster cries, you're going to deny me three times, right? Yeah. Ends up denying Christ. That's his buddy. And people are like, no, I don't know. I don't know any of them. And then, of course, Jesus. What society would look at is, you know, when he came into, came into Jerusalem, right? That on a donkey and they're waving palm leaves and he's like, you know, he's going to be our rescuer, right? And excited about him coming and then before you know it, the people are saying crucify him and they're nailing him to a cross and they're, you know, they're, you know, rejecting him. Society said he was a loser. So all these examples came out of the end fulfilling their call and influencing a generation. So when we talked about the boxer earlier, what was interesting about through all of that, he ends up coming back, he gets a fight. Um, there's, a, there's a fighter at that time, this was during the time of Mike Tyson, and you know, some of those big boxers, Holyfield, you know, when boxing was like top level stuff. There was a boxer named uh, Tommy Morrison, who they called the, the White Mike Tyson, and he was a beast. This guy would knock people out like crazy. I remember watching when I was a kid. Well, what happened was they scheduled a fight uh, for uh, Brent to fight Tommy Morrison because Tommy was getting ready to fight another title fight. And they thought it would be a good warm-up fight for Brent, for Tommy, just to fight Brent because he was a big guy. He was like, okay, you know, this will be good. I can make, you know, make some money. Tommy, uh, uh, Michael, ben, uh, Tommy was like, okay, not a big deal. It's like a spark fight. Well, what happens is Michael Bent gets out there and knocks Tommy Morrison out cold. Didn't even, didn't even know like where he was. It was that bad. I think it was like in the first round. Like just crazy. It shouldn't have happened. So all those naysayers in the past were like, ah, oh, he's no good. He comes in and knocks uh, Tommy Morrison out. Shocked, shocked the boxing world. Then he fights another fight against another fighter who he should have beat easily and just gets his world rocked again, and loses again. And through that fight, he occurred damage, different things that said he shouldn't be able to fight again, he's not gonna be able to fight again. So what, it, what was interesting about Michael is that he discovered a passion through fighting in the films and in the books. And because of all his experiences, he was able to influence and some of those boxing movies that we've seen influenced them have the reality of what boxing life is really like and found passion in from the world of what he lost in. His passion grew through that. The golfer, um, the French golfer that lost the British Open went on to play golf. He never won another major, but he still played. He won some money, different things like that was good. But what was interesting is that golf at that time was an old man sport, is what they said. And what happened was he influenced a generation of golfers, of young kids. When he went back to France, there were kids signing up for golf lessons all over the place because he made golf look fun. <laughs> golf can be fun, believe it or not. But through that, he influenced a generation of golfers to come up and to start joining the sport. So through his loss, he was able to influence a generation of golfers to continue golfing. Now what's interesting about that is when we look at these, in a sense, losers that we talked about earlier, through all their trials and the situations of where they grew up from, when we look at Joseph, I read it at the beginning, he said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Through a season, the world saw him as a loser, where God was just preparing him for the win. 
David was referred to a man after God's own heart. Even through all the situations of his loser moments, David knew where the source was and how to get back to it. And God called him a man after God's own heart. Samson found that God's promise to stay true. At the end of his life, he found that he gained his strength back and won a mighty victory. Peter, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Through his denying of Christ, God still said, I will build my church upon you. A winning moment. And then of course Jesus, he conquered death, hell, and the grave. And provided a winning, a winning moment for generations for us to be saved. Now what's amazing about this is that when we look at all those stories, especially those of the Bible, imagine your life and all the losing moments of your life being laid out in a book for everybody to see. <laughs> I wouldn't want that. But God provided examples for us so that we can be encouraged that when the enemy comes and tells us, hey, you're a loser. You don't deserve these things. You don't deserve the stuff that I have for you. We can look back and say, you know what? David was a man after God's own heart. God died on the cross for me. You know what? I'm a child of the king. I am not a loser. I have things that God has in me to accomplish. And I'm not going to let the lives of the enemies destroy me because of what the world may say about me. One mistake or one happening or one issue is not going to define who you are in God. Because he tells me who I am. Not the world. You know, I, when I was going over this and, and reading over this, I was thinking about my own children. And, you know, there's just some things they do sometimes, right? That's like, why? 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 And sometimes we may, may make some mistakes and say some things that we regret to them. Because what we say to them is important. Because it's going to develop their mindset of who they think they are and what their character is. And never in the, in the Word of God has God ever said that we are losers, that we're not worth anything. He's always wrapped his arms around us, even in those times of mistakes or situations that we've messed up. He said, we're there. Just like the prodigal son, you know, the father coming off the porch and just standing there with his arms wide open. I'm just glad you're home. I don't care about what you did. I'm just glad you're home. The enemy wants to lie to you and say that that's not what God has for you. And so sometimes we sit back and we stay confined because we're letting the enemy lie to us about that there's not a purpose or there's not a hope for us. When God says, I've got more than what you could ever imagine planned for you. And we just have to open ourselves up to God and say, God, I was a loser. But now you say who I am. You've taken that from me. I'm learning from those situations. I'm growing from those things. I'm getting better through you. We are not defined by what the world says we, we are, because it's what God says we are. And I just want to finish off saying this, what was interesting about Peter, Peter was a fisherman, and the biggest adversary for fishermen is the water, right? The water is going to determine if it's rough out, if they can go out, you know, depending on how hot or how cold it is, whether fishing is going to be good. And I was thinking about that. 
and of thinking about an experience that Peter had with Jesus with water. And Jesus said, Peter, step out of the boat and come to me. And Peter stepped out and started walking on water. You know what's amazing about that? Not just the fact that he walked on water. But God was saying, you know what? You can walk on anything that tries to come against you. It's beneath your feet. You are a winner. You have the availability to do whatever you want through me. Isn't that amazing? God gives us the availability to do whatever we want through him. Amen. If the musicians would come, I'm going to finish up here. Last week at youth service, um, we had a great time at youth service. It was amazing. I had a lesson all prepared. We started a series, and I was like, you know, I'm like, I want to I wanna finish this series because it's great. And we started singing a song, and the young people were worshiping, and, and I, and through the song, God was just speaking to me and saying, hey, just set this aside because I have a word for the young people. And uh, I'm like, okay, God, <laughs> just speak through me because I have no idea. And the question was, how do you know God has you? How do you know, and I, I use more slang, and I know it's not correct, but how do you know God's got you? Right? How do you know God's got you? And the young people were raising their hands, and they were giving good Bible answers. Well, he died on the cross for me. Right? He's given me promises. He's been there at times I'm needing him, right? Those are all, you know, good Bible answers. But I wanted to really know how, other than just because the Bible tells us, how do you know God's got you? Do you know just because the Bible tells you so? Or do you really know in your heart that God's got you? Because all of this is about relationship. All of this is about relationship. Finding who you are in God. Stepping out of what the world is telling you that you're a loser. Stepping out of that and building a relationship with God so he can show you how to come out of those things and use those for his good and not for what the enemy intended to hurt you with. So I want to ask you this morning, how do you know God's got you? Do you have your own personal relationship story of how you know God's got you? Let's all stand. So Lord, right now we just thank you, God. We thank you for this time of your word, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you that you have called us to more than what this world sees us as. Lord, the enemy comes at us and the world comes at us and tells us that we're losers for the mistakes that we've made. They try to condemn us for the things that we've done. But God, we know what the enemy has intended to hurt us with, that you have good that will come from it. God, I ask this this morning, Lord, God, that there are people in their heart that know that there's things that, that they need to do better in or feel like that they're losing in or not being successful in, Lord God. I just ask that you just speak to their hearts right now, Lord God. Speak to their minds, Lord Jesus. Encourage them, Lord. Let them know that you have them. Give them that special relationship that they need to know that even in times, maybe, that all they have is the word, all they have is the promise that you were there for them, Lord God. Encourage us, Lord Jesus, to be able to worship your name, to lift you up, to help encourage others, Lord God. Lord, let us be able to step out and be bold. Let us see that even though, again, through our mistakes or through our losing moments, that there are amazing things that can come from them. 
passions and dreams that can come become real through those things, Lord Jesus. Ministries that would come through them, Lord God, to help others that may be in situations or things that are going on that people can step into their lives and speak life into them and hope into them, Lord God. Lord, help us be more like you that when we see those that may be struggling or having issues, that our own biased consciousness doesn't just consider them losers, Lord, but that we would just speak your truth to them, Lord God. That we would speak your love into their lives, Lord Jesus. That we would raise, help raise them up and lift them up, Lord. The world is already intending to hurt them, Lord God. But let us be those that rush in to lift them up, to love them, to help heal them through you, Lord God. We thank you for this time. I just ask that you bless everyone here this morning. Keep your hands upon them. As Clint sings, I just want you guys to take a few minutes this morning and just, let's just thank God for the trials and situations we've been through, where he's taken us from to where we are today. And then just not where we are today, but thank God for where he's going to take us in the future. Because God doesn't just intend for us to just stay where we are. No matter, I said in our prayer this morning before service, from the young to the old, God is still encouraging us to move forward, to still be active, to still show his love and his light to others that are out there. We're in a generation of just leaving it here, coming in and leaving it here and walking out. We're in a generation that needs more than just that. We need to be his light. We need to be his example. We need to show people how to find God in our loser moments. Amen. Let's just worship with, with the, as Clint sings this morning.
done that can even serve or remotely serve God? I'm telling you, there's an answer here right now. And it's Jesus waiting for you to let you know and speak into your life that you're my child. And there's nothing that you've ever done that would separate me from you. And when I look at you, I don't see what you did in the past. I see what you're doing right now. And I see that you're accepting me into your life. And all that other junk is in the past. I don't even see it. I don't even see it on you. But what I do see is I see your potential. And I see what you can affect in the future. And if you feel that way this morning, these altars are open. We'll have some elders that are here to pray for you. And just not if you just feel that way, but if you just need, you know, a refreshing of, you know, God, I made some mistakes. You know, Paul said he had to die daily in his flesh, right? Repent of his sins. If you just need a refreshing of the Holy Spirit, he is here today to just dwell in you and give you that encouragement to go on. Because sometimes, like I said, when we leave here, we go and we do what we do. And then we come back and we plug in. And then we walk out the doors, we unplug. And then we come back and we plug in. And then we walk out and we unplug. Today I want to challenge you to stay plugged into God. Keep Him in your heart. Keep Him in your mind. Constantly just stay plugged into Him. And He's going to open doors. He's going to give you avenues of being able to witness to people or love on people or, like I said, speak truth into their lives things that the world is not doing for them. And if you need that this morning, if you need just a recharge and just like a boost, this is here for you also. So as we continue worshiping, if you need to go, you're blessed in Jesus' name. You may leave. You're dismissed. But if you really want that just